All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is the KCP community meeting, September 21st, 2021. Uh, just like the Earth, Wind, and Fire song. Um, I wanted to um, go over, uh, there's a, a packed agenda today, so I'm going to try to go fast. Um, the demo two uh, outline, which is here, for uh, a lot more information and a lot more detail. Um, but I think the main sort of distillation of those items is uh, is roughly this. Uh, be able to do namespace granularity scheduling and moving. I have uh, a PR in the works that is attempting to do that, um, both scheduling whole namespaces, picking up new items in namespaces and assigning it to that namespaces cluster, um, reacting to clusters becoming unavailable and unassigning and then reassigning that namespace and everything in that namespace. Um, I should have something, I think, hopefully this week to share, possibly a demo before next week, but uh, no promises. So that's that's sort of the, the uh, big scheduling change in demo two. Uh, the demo two notes or uh, bullet points out also uh, make a distinction between physical clusters and location. Um, the distinction is, uh, just for review, the distinction between a physical cluster and a location is that one physical cluster can represent multiple locations. So you could have one uh, you know, GKE cluster and say, though this is one GKE cluster, it represents location uh, A with resources, uh, you know, five CPUs, 100 gigs of RAM, and a GPU. And it also slices into a location with uh, whatever ARM nodes or uh, a different set of CPUs and RAM uh, and disk. So a real physical cluster can represent multiple locations. Each location has a sinker, I think, is the current direction we are going. So one physical cluster could have three sinkers. If it has three locations, three sinkers sort of living inside a bubble inside that cluster. Um, the benefit of this is that it lets you um, dial up one location in a physical cluster while you dial the other one down if you want to uh, change the, the shift of resources that are available in that cluster, you can say, OK, well, now this now cluster, sorry, location B has you know 10 more gigs of RAM, and location A has 10 fewer gigs of RAM. That lets you shift over um, resources in that cluster. Um, I'm not sure whether we need to do this. It is progress we should show. That's something we want to be able to do eventually. Um, but I, uh, I don't know how critically important it is uh, uh, beyond it, you know, to be inside the demo, it might be something we do quickly after. Something I do think, which is something we'd want to show, is multi-cluster ingress. I see what team is here. Um, something we want to be able to do probably at the, at the namespace granularity when a namespace moves from a uh, physical cluster or location A to B, uh, we need to up, update its ingress to say uh, where to find it now. Um, this is still. For namespace granularity moving, uh, it's still single cluster. Like there's only one cluster that is being pointed to by that ingress at any given time. But that might change as the as the thing gets moved across clusters and across you know potentially across clouds, across you know, uh, regions and physical locations in the world. Um, this is distinct and different from a single multi-cluster ingress that might route traffic to two different clusters behind the scenes, um, which is something we want in the fullness of time, but not something that would have to come up with a namespace granularity uh, scheduling and moving. Um, Joaquin, does that seem uh, doable? I mean, it seems easier, actually, than, than the thing I think you've been targeting, which is full multi-cluster uh, routing of, of traffic. Uh, not sure, honestly. Okay. Uh, I will have to, yeah, I will have to review what what those that actually mean, you know. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. As we as we progress on this, I think um, we'll obviously keep having these meetings, and we'll talk whenever we need to 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 align. Um, the other thing that is included in the demo bullet points in 163 is um, some 
some resource of workspace. Uh, workspace is the new name or a new concept for a logical cluster to be able to also attach things like policy to it and say, this logical cluster is allowed to schedule to these uh, uh, physical clusters or locations um, or other policies attached to those things. Um, we need to, we have some vague ideas about what that resource looks like. I think we don't have anything set in stone that we can like commit to for very, very long-term support, but at least having something there that we can start to hang policy off of um, will let us iterate on that and come up with something we like better and better and better until eventually we come up with the perfect thing. Um, yeah, and that, <clears throat> sorry, um, okay. that might be interesting as well uh, to start quite soon with, with at least the first draft definition of workspaces, also in the context of API management API negotiation, API binding, because now, I mean, we have to take the, sub the topic of more seriously defining how um, uh, a set of APIs are enforced or, you know, made a, the default in a given um, logical cluster in a, in a given workspace. And for now, this was, you know, since logical clusters were um, not defined and not uh, constrained by any, by any policy. Uh, so only added by adding a CRD directly uh, on the logical cluster. But but yeah, I think we have to streamline this, and for that we have to have the workspaces object as well. So yeah, the the um, more on, on several uh, uh, aspects. The the what you're saying is the CRD negotiation strategy of whether whether to automatically roll out compatible changes or gate them or who can gate them or gating them in entirely is a workspace policy uh, config. And then yes, uh, yeah, th th there is this aspect uh, of you probably, but also the fact that inside a workspace, we have to, to define more declaratively um, the set of APIs that would be made available in a given workspace. And then for that, we have to, you know, um, define what type of, of how this would be declaratively, you know, uh, added into yeah, the there, logical cluster. For now, it's just, there have to be know, there have to be a there has to be a, a transactionally a transaction not the right word a consistent API evolution of types within the namespace because the namespace mm -hmm. is a bucket for the type instances. And so you have to you have to manage the evolution of that, and that was actually I think one of the the good parts of that discussion yesterday was really mm -hmm. highlighting the attributes. I've added some of those things to the ADR. Um, I do think we could pick a a small subset of it and say like we can skip over some parts of the problem, but it's great if we can at least frame where we're going in terms of well we know we need to do like the end logical the end goal would be the version of a scheme of a resource which is completely unmodeled in cube today because we didn't need to and we're like oh we'll just you know throw some stuff around it it, it is modeled as part of our api evolution story but actually going that step further and concretely modeling the evolution of a, of a typed schema would then open the door for um how we move it how you think about life cycle like there's a whole bunch of problems that people have that just don't go away we just basically papered over in the lifecycle strategy of a cube cluster until somebody takes away CRD v1 beta 1 yeah. and it all falls down. Yeah, because uh, to, to take an analog an analogy, for example, for logical clusters, um, the implementation is very and was very complicated at the beginning because you have no constraint. You can have um, ma as many logical clusters as you want. It's really on demand according to you know the URL you point to. So that makes things completely dynamic, but of dynamic. But of course, as soon as you have workspace objects and policies that clearly identify um, a logical cluster, then things are you know easier. You, you can name the various logical clusters. You have a, a, um, a clear number of logical clusters that you can clearly identify. And it seems to me that for uh, APIs, we are a bit in the in the same situation currently, because nothing was clearly defined and declaratively um, added. So we have something that is completely automatic. Mainly, you know, you just join a cluster to the logical cluster, physical cluster to the logical cluster, and then everything is uh, imported automatically. And we try to define heuristics of 
uh, how this should work. But it seems to me that as soon as we add a workspace object and clearly define the way to uh, import, I mean, to enforce some APIs inside the workspace from the user point of view, uh, then this would make things, you know, and add also some constraints like uh, you cannot evolve um, an API inside the workspace if you have already objects on it, for example, or a number of constraints that you don't, we don't have for now, then it will make the overall design of the rest of the API negotiation uh, probably simpler and a bit, at least a bit clearer in the direction we want to go. So David, I was going to ask, like, do you think, um, so I, I captured some of yesterday's discussion at the at the end of the, the ADR doc on sharding, yeah. just because it's it's the most convenient place to talk about a bunch of the problems, <laughs> and we can split it back out into separate docs over time. Um, maybe by the end of next week, um, I'd like to get to a point where we have like a a straw man for a workspace object. Mm. Um, the straw man, which is kind of captured in some of the docs and and stuff on organization policy or organization workspace, which would be like the virtual, like because you're Foo, yeah. you can come in and create a workspace object. And then um, Steve's currently looking at the workspace part of it yeah. and the API part of it. So the three of us at a minimum, and I mean, ideally we can break it down to smaller chunks that we each are mostly solo on to get to a point where we have like a, a V alpha one workspace object that gets enough yeah. of the problem that for mm -hmm. the demo two, we have enough pieces. And then we, we identify which parts of the API evolution we want to model versus leave unmodeled. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a good goal for, for end of next week? Yes, I think at least I, I think we, we have to, to have the workspace and, and, and I probably need also answer, I mean, to answer still some some questions what would be the way to for a user to define to enforce an api so do we need a distinct object for, from crd what what is the current way right. or today to enforce an api so there are some questions and then this new object would be referred to from the workspace or i mean i think there are some things we have to settle <laughs> upon and then and then yes this would enable Ad uh, adapting the current API negotiation to to, to this new yeah. direction. So, please, so maybe uh, the app. Oh, go ahead, please. Could you, uh, for folks that weren't in the whatever forum this came up in, could you summarize the discussion you had yesterday? What incited it? Anything that came out of it? Like what? What is the discussion yesterday referring to? Uh, Steve, um, Steve, who was playing around. Steve asked a, a couple of good questions that David had the flip side of. So it was, what are the similarities between um, when you do negotiation, you are trying to find out the version of an API that you can put into a workspace so that a user can create objects that can then get translated to physical cluster. Uh, Steve was looking at kind of the flip side of it, which was um, how do I know which version of a resource a bunch of workspace or a bunch of workspaces have for the sinker use case of how would I go get if I'm sinker A on location A on physical cluster A, how do I go find the all of the things that someone has defined? And so actually the discussion was and I added it to the end of the doc. Um, there's a link to a recording that Steve did of the hour meeting and we're trying to like pull things out of it, but it basically boiled down to breaking out the, the four elements, which is um, a workspace has a set of APIs with a specific schema as part of a, a life cycle of that API and evolution. There's a set of generations where an API remains compatible until it stops being compatible, right? So if you add a field, and add a field and add a field and add a field, those are all compatible. If you remove a field, that stops being compatible mm -hmm. uh, as the simplest possible definition. So there's a there's a graph or a, a line of an evolution. We have to take a specific point on that line and put that into workspace. And then someone has to be able to see all of the workspaces that are on that line. And we talked about, you know, how does a workspace evolve down that line? So like a workspace, has to know what the minimum schema is to accept and the schema evolves so each version on that line so let's say that there's a crd 
just for the sake of argument, or an API type, it's got a UID, which might be some unique identifier of its arc over history. Um, and then it's got a generation, which is each gen each each thing is a set of uh, additive changes mm -hmm. down the life cycle, the same way like a table in a database might have a, a logical set of schema changes. The line, a, a whole bunch of lines is the set of APIs that go into a workspace. A syncer sets up and keep makes those lines happen. So a syncer adds things to the end of each of those lines as the API evolves on a cluster. Um, or some other component that sits alongside the sinker. When a cluster is no longer able to fit onto one of those lines because it's broken the schema, that's a the workspace that referenced that is still on the line. The cluster is no longer on the line. So like we're basically just it was like we were working through that. Um, to summarize, the hour really needs to happen in the form of a doc. I think that's kind yeah. of what we're kind of dancing around is like get get the minimal concepts pulled out draw a picture. Um, I can take some of the drawing a picture because I was going to do that today anyway. But David, I was David and I were kind of talking about the how do we actually talk about the evolution of those lines mm. for a workspace because a workspace has to know the set of APIs that it can expose. And that doesn't necessarily happen with inside the workspace. That happens outside the workspace because we expect to have tens of thousands of workspaces potentially sharing that same set of lines. And we want to we want to be able to like somebody add something to the line and all the workspaces need to move along the line to allow new fields to show up in their schema. Conversely, we need to talk about what happens when somebody breaks the line or removes the line. So it's like, we're, we're basically talking about that, that thing that kind of sat underneath negotiation, underneath sinker and underneath APIs, which is basically the API design for large chunks of reused schema evolution APIs over time. Yeah, the the I think the inciting uh, question for all of that was if I am a multi cluster controller trying to list who's across workspaces, how do I make sure I don't get wildly incompatible foos from two different workspaces? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that is actually there's Sinker is one type of multi cluster controller, right. and the novel part of Sinker is that Sinker has something that's driving a line. The uh, most normal controllers you would be offering your controller implementation and you would maintain the line yourself. So let's say you're yeah. uh, you're adding the etcd operator to, and you wanna expose the etcd API object, you are responsible for adding new versions of the schema that are compatible. The moment you want to break compatibility, you may need, so we, we went through a little bit of that design as well. Uh, that doesn't quite overlap with Sinker. Like Sinker's a little, Sinker doesn't, Sinker does, isn't the source of truth for the API the same way that a controller that's exposing the etcd object might be the owner of that api so the it's what happens when the sort when the sinker is downstream of the source of truth which is the cluster because someone could add or remove apis on that cluster and the sinker has to communicate and update those lines and then flag when uh, you know there's a there's a missing uh, when the source of truth cannot be reconciled because workspaces are the source of truth of what instances are being created. The definitions are source of truth from the cluster and the sync, the negotiation sits in the middle of that. So it's, it's, it's a different loop than a controller and we need to come up with a name for it. And we were working through the use case. It was a great discussion because it actually surfaced most of the problems that we're attempting to solve from the perspective of if I could run a controller over long periods of time and replace implementations or evolve the API and have two incompatible versions of the same API available at the same time, how would I do it? What are the common elements that we talk about? Uh, stuff that's been talked around in Cube, but Cube has no need to solve that problem except by writing an API compatibility doc. Um, even things like OLM or some of the add-on management stuff, just really like even Helm like basically threw up its hands by not allowing you to make you know incompatible changes, not allowing you to update CRDs. It's a it's indicative of the underlying gap in I want to offer an API to thousands of consumers and I want to manage the life cycle of that API over deep time, you know, years or over multiple different implementations, multiple different schemas. What are the tools I would need? So it was actually, it was probably the most important hour long discussion we've had so far. Uh, and we need to get it into paper form so that we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, one question I have from that is like, so a controller 
you're saying uh, a controller runs uninterrupted for a year, and in the meantime, that API that it's controlling on could change, add fields, remove fields, all, all compatible changes over that year, but the controller never needs to renegotiate, negotiate's the wrong word, re rediscover that type because it just knows what that type is. Um, I think a missing piece of that is the control, there's no way for the controller to report what fields it cares about about that object, about that type. Uh, and so there's no way to know whether the change you're about to make to the API uh, type will become incompatible with the controller. Or you're saying the controller is in charge of the controller is sure. part of the machinery in charge of that API lifecycle. And so you can't make that change. Both of those are valid use cases. There's the somebody a human sits down and makes a decision to add or remove a field. A human has an implementation tied to versions of an API. A lot of forward compatible API, forward and backwards compatible APIs. Um, you know, the only there's really only one API strategy, which is never break anything, and you can only add stuff. And that's actually true in schemas, right? Mm -hmm. In database schemas, the only operation that is safe is add, and you always have to provide a default. Every other problem is a distributed coordination problem because you effectively have to make sure that all readers, all consumers, stop using the old field before you change its meaning. So what we're kind of talking about here is how would we build schema evolution into, and so there's a couple ways you could do it. Um, when you have to change the meaning of a field, there has to be some way to signal which of the meanings that you prefer. So when you change the meaning of a field, you're effectively breaking the API and that API now forks into two different branches. So instead of a line, you have a graph. An implementation might very well need to know both which, like the API schema is the same, but the behavior is different. That mechanism, that concept has no solution or, or option today, but you would need it to be able to do long-term evolution. So, you know, whether that's something that's actually materialized on the person consuming that API, like a feature flag. Feature flags are great examples of, I want a different behavior. Um, another example would be like which implementation. Like we'll talk about how we model this and all that. It's, we're, we just kind of surface the questions. But it, Jason, I think your point is, if you only add fields and you never change behavior or remove anything, your controller just keeps trucking. Mm -hmm. At some point, you either introduce a new API version that's like fully different that changes in a non-compatible way, which most people do all the time accidentally. In those scenarios there's a different implementation, you might actually just fork the controller code-wise, and you'd have the old controller using the old objects, new controller using the new, or you might have the same controller doing two different lists, one for all the people that expect the old behavior and all the people that expect the new behavior. And if your code in the controller knows the difference between those two, it just says like, oh, the old, if you expected the old implementation, here's the behavior I offer. Um, but even a canary or a canary rollout of a deployment, how would you safely roll out a change to a controller implementation across tens of thousands of different consumers without being certain that you didn't regress them? So a canary is there's two implementations for the same API. You need a way to move and manage the who is responsible. So think about like, what is the equivalent of a controller deployment object? in cube there is none today but like it would be something like the this instance handles these consumers and you move them over until you've reached 100 percent and then the old implementation is no longer necessary now some problems won't break down that way um, so you might have things like blue green you have two controllers one that's talking to the old and one that's talking to the new teams opt in to go from the blue implementation to the green implementation or someone drives them. So just thinking about it, it is 100% so the same problem people have rolling out code today. What is the mechanism that would exist that would allow that transition to happen? And it comes roughly down to, are you exposing something that could break or not? How do you test? What are the strategies you use? Those look very similar to existing patterns in Cube today. What would be the things that that how would a CI system or a deployment system actuate who talks to whom through the basic idea of what David was referring to? There's a definition somewhere of an API. There's a binding of it into a workspace or a binding, like, you know, something's updating a definition coming from a physical cluster. That mechanism, we kind of worked through enough that we were starting to surface APIs for everything outside of a workspace. 
Interesting. I still have questions, but I, there's a lot more on the uh, agenda. And yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend uh, yeah. let me paste the link into the chat. I'll paste the link into the agenda. Uh, I recommend okay. folks watch the the hour if you are interested in this problem, um, because we did kind of go back and forth. Uh, if folks don't have access to it, I will make Steve probably needs to share it, and I will do that now. Okay. Oh, no, yeah. no, it is shared with KCP Dev. So oh, okay, perfect. Uh, I wanted um, to the agenda. Thanks. Yeah, because I think I think that's going to be we're discovering as we go along things that multi-cluster controllers need to care about. I mean, multi-cluster controllers are just a subset of all multi-cluster users. So multi-cluster users will have this problem whether they are a controller implementation or a human client typing out, you know, YAML. Um, we'll have we'll have the same problems uh, as the computers, which is good and bad. Um, does that uh, are there any other uh, Clayton documents shared on the mailing list and state that you want to do a quick summary on? Was that um... uh, this actually covered the vast majority of my summary? So we we've, we've actually moved through it. Um, Steve and I were iterating on the distributed list watch. There hasn't been a ton since the last meeting. Um, what we were kind of doing is inputs about these kinds of problems, like a given workspace has this research, this API at this schema version with this, you know, UID for the, whatever we call it, API UID, like this is the same thing. Um, that'll be a fundamental input to list across because you actually need to list all of the things that are in your schema history that can be convertible back to the thing. So if you had API version five, you want to list watch everything that's five or below that you're aware of or something like that. So like we, it started to open up some of those cases of most of the list watches are across resources. How do you have a consistent definition of a resource across shards, um, across multiple instances? You would do it. So, and that, and like, what's, what we would need for clients. So we haven't made them a lot of changes, but this discussion, then we'll go back and we'll put some more thought into, um, what you just described, Jason, which is we need to understand if I'm a client and I'm asking for ingress and I say ingress v1, I need to know which ingress v1 I need. And all of the instances res responding to that request to return v1 have to give me a v1 that I can understand. What does understand ingress v1 mean? And it's the addition of at least a schema evolution number and potentially a schema UID or yeah, we're kind of talking about that. So that's basically the only change to the sub doc. Yeah, I think the, it's helpful to me to not to not trust the API version at all. Like the API, the, the API version string is a promise or a hope. It's an opaque. Yeah, it's an opaque like, thing that means nothing. Yeah, and and uh, the same v1 alpha one object can be completely different than another v1 alpha one object because humans suck. Um, and one um, wrinkle. We, yeah. we had a there was a short sidebar in the discussion where we were like we could imagine a scenario where two different people uh, uh, we it wasn't CRD we were using as the example we were talking about um, someone who needs to move from like a, a one API version to another where there's any kind of assumption about breakage uh, it may be that CRDs the way that are implemented in Cube actually does not work for us in a way that we would need aspects which is it might actually be the right behavior for us would be to allow their a controller to say, oh, I don't actually care whether a workspace has two versions of this. They're completely different things as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But instead of doing conversion into storage, we do conversion into schema lines. And then at read time, the things that have a conversion from a particular schema line to another get infilled so like imagine you had ingress v1 beta 1 and ingress uh, i'm trying to think of one that's actually incompatible out there let's just say for the sake of argument v1 beta 1 ingress and uh, gateway maybe v1 ingress and gateway uh, it may actually be the case that someone might want to leave ingress v1 and gateway but have someone be able to read ingress as gateway if those are convertible or a controller that just reads both. Thinking through the use cases, it might actually be that some of what we allow in CRDs in a single workspace might need to change. That was just a little sidebar, but it was starting to open that door for what does version string mean? And the answer is, as you said, Jason, nothing. Nothing. 
<laughs> it's a, it's another string to append to the other string that means anything you want. Uh, I, all of this talk also makes me like all, any new requirement we have on controllers to be able to do smarts. Uh, I want to to the comment in the chat package into a framework that we build the controllers on. Like that, th this is not something each controller should have to care about because writing controllers is already massively painful. We don't need we didn't we need to like simplify that and then add complexity while simplifying it, which is. It, and the problem David found this week where um, like the protobuf negotiation controller, like controller, some of the client libraries hard code sending protobuf for core types. Um, there's actually two other issues that came up just coincidentally this week in cube, um, not allowing nested maps and not allowing floats by default in controller runtime generation. Those are opinions that came from cube API conventions, which were mm -hmm. rules about guidelines about cube like APIs that fit into core. Uh, there was actually some discussion on the API reviewers where we were like, no, 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 those are guidelines. Those aren't defining the full set of APIs that are allowed under yeah. CRDs. Yeah. So we, we made some quick rulings there, but it did highlight, um, we're probably gonna formalize a little bit what it means to have a, what do CRDs support? And what does cube conventions mean? There's an interesting space there of like, even it's very easy to misinterpret those. There'll be a lot of work in the ecosystem that we'll probably want to drive and, and lead, which is, can we actually get some of those definitions firmed up in cube so that it's easy for controller runtime to interpret so that the people don't get broken? Yeah, because for now, even in KCP, we have uh, in all the hacks uh, on the Kubernetes branch, we have a number of places where we um, make assumptions to convert OpenAPI v2, I mean, OpenAPI schema v2 to v3. The old, uh, you know, Kubernetes extensions like patch match and stuff like that, patch match k, to the new extensions, list map k's and stuff like that as well. And all this currently works, somehow works, but is based on, you know, assumptions of how, um, and Kubernetes works currently, but obviously there would be a number of things to clearly define and 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 agree uh, explicitly agree upon to be sure that that and, uh, schemas are not mixed up or messed up. And, and actually, like my next pull bullet on the CEL stuff. So yeah. Jordan and I, for at least Jordan's been looking for a couple of months at CEL. It turns out Joe Betts had actually been working on, and he got a cap that will go into alpha, which is using CEL to do extended validation in open API uh, in our CRD specs so that um, you know the validation beyond types, can we break it down? It's better than webhooks, like webhooks have a whole bunch, like if you read through the challenges on webhooks in the CEL doc, it's part of the reason why webhooks aren't turned on right now in KCP. Uh, but the, the the general topic is, are there ways to simplify our validation rules for API objects or look for patterns that would take the complex rules we have in Cube, boil them down to things that could be represented in a way that's that's truly like tied to the schema that then would allow us to potentially not need full webhook validation in some cases, even though admission may still want it. Um, but that also gets back, David, to what you were just saying, which is like the rules of what's allowed and the rules mm -hmm. of how they behave. No one has really done that for core types. Mm -hmm. One of my thoughts is as we go down the CEL stuff is that we may want to actively take some of those things that we've discovered about the core types and try to apply those rules to the core types. Like it's we, there's a same insane levels of validation in pod templates, but anybody building a workload controller has to re-implement all of those themselves. Is there something that's missing in Cube, whether that's you know expression validation rules in the open API doc, whether it's uh, other unfilled gaps that would allow us to have reuse more reusable chunks of important validations that would allow us to say things like, what if you wanted to embed a pod template in your workload controller? What would you have to do to validate it correctly that kind of they end up helping to solve the problem that we have right now with those hacks in KCP, but they actually drive the ecosystem in the right direction, which is someone who has a, a CRD that wants to use pod templates, doesn't want to have a, C a CEL expression doc that's like well, both my hands don't fit on my screen, <laughs> this big. Um, yeah, so. that reminds me as well of uh, on, on the cube native types, there is somewhere in Kubernetes, a very big list of exceptions 
um, for you know generation of of the all the the generated uh, stuff um, based on you know uh, open API and stuff like that because there are many uh, expected extensions uh, and annotations in the source that are not there in fact in the native uh, APIs and so you have somewhere a very big list of exceptions so that the generation process would be able to still work. <laughs> so that, that that's also something that I assume at some point should be fixed and, and everything should be consistent with the rules that are normally expected to be to be followed on in, in all the source structs of, of the Kubernetes uh, resources. So uh, uh, two things. One is I think like I'm all for CEL for basic simple validation conversion, everything, anything that can be expressed in CEL should, uh, because it's easier to do that than, than in Go and setting up webhooks. But I think there will still always be cases where you need webhooks. Like Tekton's web, webhook validation is a monster, and three-fourths of it could probably be rewritten into fairly simple CEL. But the other quarter of it is like, is this a DAG? Are there cycles in this DAG, which you, Theoretically, maybe you could write that in CEL, but now you're just like, you know, this is a fundamentally hard thing, whether it's in CEL or Go, and Go is uh, has better testing support. And, so, and and I think like some of those things actually get into API design, like to to square the circle is like there's concepts that you can express in Cube with inline code that are in some respects a simplification for API consumers. They're essential complexity, and sometimes they're accidental complexity. Where if you treat it as a um, a desired state versus the realized state. If any aspect of that desired state could change, it doesn't necessarily fit into like the validation rule, which is why we have controllers helping us crisp up as part of like what are the patterns for APIs. Like Cube started that with API conventions. That's the only reason API conventions exists, which was like to encode a few exist a few examples of hard won knowledge into there. We certainly have failed to reify those patterns. So to get back to Adele's point as well, like controllers exist to solve problems. Currently today to map, I have problem to how I should implement it in a distributed system that involves cube uh, and that involves like certain problems. That's a gap. Like one of the hopeful things I have about KCP in the larger ecosystem is can we actually build patterns like a pattern library and, a, and get controller runtime and cube. Like cube is trying to be a pattern library for distributed systems. But practically what that means is, are we really good at helping you solve a problem so that you, you know what all the ways it's gonna fail upfront are. Like if your problem looks like this, if you do these things and you follow this stuff, the end outcome will be success for you. Not everybody has the distributed systems problem, just everybody in this room does, and everybody who's deploying on top of Cube, and anybody who's deploying services into cloud native apps. So if you're building cloud native apps, you have a distributed systems problem. It's ultimately our ecosystem's responsibility to try and solidify patterns into logic. And, and what you just described, Jason, is like, the guidance about what should be validation, what should be admission, what should be controller, maybe we're actually missing concepts. So that's another thing I'd be like, could DAG validation be something modeled in a different way than what Cube is currently provided up till this point? Because it's close to the validation. Are webhooks the best way? Do we have other gaps that we could follow? Like that's the other types of extension, which we haven't really explored yet. What is the lifecycle guarantees on an API for those? Um, how do you pair those to implementations? Um, that's another branch of the, can we, with their webhooks, which is, can we actually remove the need for a webhook by providing a better alternative to a webhook? Uh, we're not gonna do that this year um, or within a year's time, but can we set the, the things in motion that call it out? We're on, like, that's the great part is like, by forcing ourselves to turn these over, we can say, we'll turn webhooks on now, we'll tee that up for next year, or yeah. we'll break the problem into two and we'll create a little bit of pain to force people to think about the alternatives. So that's very interesting because um, well, I, I don't want to go too too far too quickly, but but um, regarding the demo of running Dev Workspace controller on top of KCP, uh, the main blocking part point apart from the small you know fixed things that I could fix is really webhooks. 
So to have the demo working, I just disabled them in the Dev Workspace controller. But in reality, that's not an option because here we are not mainly using webhooks for um, um, validation a bit, but that's not the main point. Also for CRD conversion, but that would be replaced by some so by the API negotiation. But the main point is for security. It's the fact that um, you run pods in which people will exec and might be able, and in those parts, we uh, there might be the case where there's their um, Kubernetes credentials are stored. So finally, there is a, a very hard security requirement, which is that only the creator, the initial creator of the um, the workspace, uh, the, the the workspace customer source, should be able should be allowed to access um, to exec inside the the, the generated pod. And so that's typically something that is completely different as a, as a use case than just you know high high level validation of the schema or something like that. And that that seems to me, uh, yeah, that some really another class of of webhooks requirements that possibly could be fixed another way. Maybe if we had some you know more generic way in Kubernetes to grab the creator of a resource and then allow only the creator some rights. We could implement I, that in another, another way, but now we're blocked. That's issue like 675 in Cube. It's almost seven and a half years old. I actually had, we, we <laughs> talked about it and then rejected it in Cube for a couple of reasons um, and we've periodically gone back. But yeah, that is a, that is a well-known class of problem that is hard to do in Cube but is fundamental to a, a set of problems that Cube does not solve well, which is uh, delegated authority, which is by updating the object, um, I as the updater at the point in time of change am authorized, mm -hmm. but that's not really binding it to an entity who is then continuously checked for those. Like, and there's 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 a bunch of different things around that, but yeah, we, sure. we tackled some parts of the problem, but we didn't really ever come back. Pods and service mm -hmm. account is the closest to analog we have, and we never explored then mm -hmm. some of these other problems because we just never got far enough. So uh, that's definitely a, a ownership yeah. slash delegation slash impersonation slash, mm -hmm. like we need to think really carefully, like are we missing a construct that we could surface up? Yeah, yeah, but, but but still, that led me to the question about you know short term and or mid term. If you want some people having you know real controllers uh, to test that that against KCP, should we temporarily, I assume, uh, still bring back some way to use webhooks or at least some way to be compatible with uh webhook definitions so that you know so i'd probably say until we need it as part of a concrete deliverable which i don't know the demo needs i'd probably say we're, we're we're getting closer to the point and we should be we should come up with the criteria for why it should be included and formalize that like mm -hmm. we need webhooks um first off like webhooks across like like already webhooks are broken and won't work with logical clusters because you have to identify the cluster it's coming from in a meaningful yeah, way. Yeah, sure. So even just getting like the basic of, we should turn webhooks on for these reasons. And here's the implication, like let's just go get that teed up. And maybe that's not demo two, but that's, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Either demo three, or it could be like a re reset of the KCB prototype into, yeah. you know, libraries or, or you know, a, a real project when it becomes a real mm. boy. Uh, Clayton, could you could you um, start by creating an issue that is just that sentence you said of we need some like it's off. Here's why it's off today. Here's what here's the kind of thing we would need to get it turned back on, and here's how that would look. It's possible that uh, it takes long enough to justify turning it on that CEL expressions take over the world and we never have to do it. But I think to David's point and to, to my point earlier, I think there's always going to be a case for webhooks that are needed. Um, so I don't right. think and, and we'll be able to live forever without webhooks, but I, I, punting as long as we can will, will be good well, for our community. And you know, are webhooks optional? 
Um, and, and that may be a thing that we would say is that someone may choose not to ever run a system and that they would say all problems that could be solved by webhooks must be solved by forking the library project and building your own version of KCP, including mm -hmm. turning on webhooks might be another outcome, but we should tee that up from a, a, a series of yeah. the whys mm -hmm. and what the criteria are for, mm -hmm. uh, are there other things that benefit by forcing MC? So yeah, I'll create the that. that um, on the on the topic of CEL, also while you were talking about it, it made me uh, remember reviewing David's code for CRD negotiation and thinking, man, it's really hard to detect a a narrowing definition. Like when when a type is being narrowed and narrowed and narrowed to be able to know whether the LCD is even possible. Our CEL expressions, their CEL validations, going to make API negotiation effectively impossible. Like if, if the validation in version X is, you know, uh, this field has to be less than 10, and then in the next, not version, but the next iteration of that version of that validation, it has to be less than nine. Can we detect that that is a narrowing definition such that the LC yeah, now right. has to be under nine for it to be valid in all clusters that are attached to me? Yeah, that's well, a no, theorem no. prover kind of problem too. So then we get into, um, I mean, you could prove it, but is that a, an example of a, uh, is there a different way to respond to validation rules, which is a tightening of validations could be flagged or identified through some other thing, or just the change of validation rule itself requires a, uh, a estimation by a human. Um, yeah. Certainly in our API evolution rules in Cube, we have occasionally allowed tightening of validation, but we consider it a breaking change and we force it to go through that. Um, we generally tried not to, except in cases where it was so likely that no one would be impacted, that it was worth it for a security trade-off. But that kind of gets into human judgment calls and yeah. nothing in normalization today. Like probably it, at some point it's, um, what does it mean when a cluster, like today a new code version of a cluster could tighten validation that you wouldn't know anyway. Uh, but when we get these better rules, how do we think through that? So yeah, so I think it's the, um, what are the human factors involved in determining schema evolution? What are the machine factors is another way of phrasing what you've asked, Jason. Yeah, uh, good yeah, point. I think, I think it means any, like as a, as a dumb, easy thing, anytime a CEL validation rule changes in any way, bump it up to a human to approve it. Uh, and also a good point that these kinds of validation rule changes are already happening undetectable by us. This means it might be detectable by us. Some some classes of validation changes will be, or a, a much more expansive class of validation changes will be detectable by us uh, where they weren't before. So that's and very good. David, if you wanted to go, I know you would. Sorry, yeah. Um, no, 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 sorry. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's OK uh, in the meantime. Yeah, like and uh, feature gates are another example of that. Um, you know, if you change if you change a feature gate, if we change a behavior, uh, somebody mm -hmm. is there a community of users who would benefit from a way of articulating what is compatible versus just reading the cube release notes? Um, would there be an incentive for someone who's running a KCP like thing to actually contribute effort? that talks through when evolution so like there's the uh who keeps like who guards the guards in cube and the answer is like nobody really like we all guard each other and we do a really we do an okay job of it i'm not going to sell us short we maybe do like 60 percent. we're about six percent good you know uh, changes in cube changes in cube break production users all the time um well-meaning changes have consequences. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a way for us to line up the incentive of lots of people in the cube ecosystem to know when things change through automation and human effort and put it into a, a thing which is like, we might not even have to wait until the KCP cluster comes up. You could very easily say like, oh, well, there's some things that you have to act we know that you're using this field that changed behavior. Uh, not saying we would actually go do it, but this is another vein of, is there a separate orthogonal thing to a KCP-like ecosystem project, which is understands what breaks in cube over time and can bring to bear large amounts of human and machine effort in a 
way that creates value. So it's like maybe imagine a, a human contributed list of all schema versions published by any cube cluster, feature gates and how they impact. Imagine that as a, a separate module that runs alongside or you run in large multi-cluster environments, mm -hmm. which performs that analysis, but can also distribute analysis questions like, is this field in use across your KCP fleet mm -hmm. is a kind of question that you can then turn into value. So like uh, in OpenShift, we've done a little bit of that, a little bit with this, with um, uh, like looking at the data, like uh, I know Google's done some of this, a couple other people in the ecosystem have talked about is where you look at the workloads, you look at what fields are in use and use that to make better decisions about what happens. This is just another variation of like, if somebody flags this field as changing behavior, that might be enough for you to build a system that says, uh, if you're not using that field, it doesn't matter. If you are using that field, it does matter. Can you help bring that info to the correct point in time, which is probably you're about to upload your update your cluster, or you're about to uh, add a new location, or you're about to migrate a workload. Do you know that those are incompatible? And maybe some of what we can do in KCP is set up an environment where that's more tenable to automate at scale for the overall ecosystem. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure I completely understand how we can detect whether a field is used or not. I think we can tell whether it's ever written by a controller. What, or written why, by why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? Oh, I, sorry, I meant use as in this field is set and not by a default. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. It, gotcha. Yeah, it, it doesn't have the zero value. Yeah. Because the assumption would be the zero value or the default value is if you break that, uh, that's a behavior break that right. might fall into that stricter thing. Maybe we're breaking the world into like, there's super things you should never break, and there's things that you're probably going to break and nobody cares. And then there's a line in the middle or a, a fat area in the middle that you want to squeeze and put things on either side of. The hard failures are stuff like, yeah, you break um, default values, you remove a field, you take APIs away. The yeah. soft stuff is you change validation. The If you aren't using a non-default value, do we know that you're not impacted such that we're like, yep, yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Maybe we could do that in bulk. Yeah, I think uh, this also goes back to um, packaging the API uh, uh, API negotiation stuff as a CI check, as something where it looks like, you know, a little paper clip shows up and says, it looks like you're changing the default value from three to five. Uh, this will break someone. Or you're adding an enum value. This is safe, but be careful. Um, and and if you think about, like, um, uh, oh, shoot. It is certainly possible to uh, find some way of like making this a collaborative like you know the best the best open source systems are the ones where everybody has a small incentive to make small changes that are easy to understand like those are the most successful communities by far and then the things that are so fundamental that everybody needs to get their fixes in um, so like linux and kubernetes and other big like projects all have that um, we might want to look at how we can uh, create that community of people can create APIs and use them. So like I think about Terraform, right? Like we've talked about this before. Um, you know, Terraform is taking upstream cloud APIs that have this level of diligence applied to them, writing an adapter layer and having almost as much diligence uh, for the big stuff. But then there's a long tail of, you know, it's just mm -hmm. impossible to bring that effort to bear. Can we reduce the friction between API definition, API evolution, and API modeling, so that people are like, well, obviously, you can just go create a CRD, and you you do the quick Terraform adapter into Cube, and then it just works in Cube, and then someone can manage the evolution of that, and you catch these because there's our more standard CI tools for testing API mm -hmm. schema mm -hmm. evolution. And the moment anybody fires up one of these systems in the real world, we're like, oh, well, that broke. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and auto-report that to the community ecosystems that are like, this regressed. And that's like the community builds on itself and creates more value than individually, uh, a bunch of individual communities would. Yeah. Uh, 
David, I'm sorry, we have two minutes for your demo of Dev Workspace Controller on top of KCP. No, I, well, no problem. In oh. fact, I just posted a link. I I uh, pushed it to to uh, YouTube, so okay. it's ten minute de ten minutes demo. A anyone can interested can have a look. And I think we already discussed the you know uh, turn and tenants of of the demo. I mean, related yeah. to webhooks and and the other fixes. So I think I think that's uh, thank you for doing that. It's great to you know, try out real world things on top of this and find out what breaks and then even better fix what breaks. So thank you for doing both of them. And, and the good, one of the good news is that it worked even without implementing, you know, the stuff like um, <clears throat> Kubernetes API, URL, LPI server URL and service account uh, change mm -hmm. that we should do so that the pods see, uh, you know, the yeah. context of KCP. All this is not there. And finally, uh, quite a reduced case uh, somehow works, worked already. So that that's quite encouraging. Right. So the, in the demo, uh, objects, CRDs are or sorry, custom resources are being synced down to the cluster where the controller is transforming them into some other thing, and then that is getting synced back up to the KCP layer to see it. But yeah, it's exactly. So where the controller talks back to KCP. It's exactly. Really so you cool. you just don't have the pods uh, on the KCP layer, and yeah. And then we sync, I think, config map, service accounts, secrets, uh, ingresses, services, and pods, uh, and deployments, sorry, and, and no, no pods. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I'm going to go read this uh, CEL cap because I have questions. But um, yeah, yeah. And, um, just just one point about CL. Um, yeah. At some point, we mentioned uh, Yegi, so that's something completely different. That's just one way, among others, to write um, you know, to interpret Go code. So that's real Go code. And I was thinking about for um, non-validating use cases. The one, for example, for example, I mentioned about you know checking the the crate or or mm -hmm. some other stuff that where there would be some uh, mutating behavior. Um, Maybe having something that can allow executing Go code in some well-known uh, untry points or you know uh, hook points, yeah, could be also some alternate alternate way to 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 web hooks. As uh, as always, I feel like or? this boils down to a like Go's plugin system is awful. Sucks. Like, it would be nice to be able to plug in code and not have to define a service that receives a, well, like JSON. If you think about it, the only reason that we're having to do any of this work in Kubernetes is because Linux's plugin mechanisms suck. And nobody ever wrote a good package manager or actually figured out how to solve a problem, partially because it's an almost intractable problem. <laughs> so one of the interesting things would be like if you look at um, uh, and the worker, um, what is it? Uh, Cloudflare's web workers with their V8 mm -hmm. isolates. They've added WASM support. If you look at the Crustlet, which is trying to do this for WASM, like mm -hmm. it's all basically variations on <clears throat> assumptions between calling boundaries are really hard. And there's like five boundaries. It's like uh, calling conventions and data types. And then there's uh, like uh, hard security boundaries within processes, mm -hmm. which, you know, any sharing processes is now already terrifying because of Spectre. And then you've got um, uh, serialization on wire protocols for either inner process or network. And then you've got the orchestration level, like you have to actually have the same meaning of two different concepts at like a super high level. And then you have to do API evolution of them. One of the interesting things in this ecosystem part would be like it sh it does behoove us to go ask some of these questions like um, when we're thinking about like running Wasm like what is fundamentally the difference between us running Wasm and something like the Cloudflare worker or the Crustlet as I'm running um, cell you know CEL doesn't have to do a data structure type transformation Wasm does for mm -hmm. strings like you actually have to have a shim on the Wasm receiving side to handle a Go string which means overhead. Um, and you know, you kind of pick the implement, like a lot of people instinctively pick the implementation that hits the performance boundary, like serializing to JSON is the worst thing in the universe. We can barely do that correctly. And yet all of computing is built on that now. So like <laughs> thinking about like what those layers are and if we can map them to problems that we know that are eventually gonna come up in the ecosystem, like at some level, 
you know, part of KCP is to open the door for someone to be able to say, like, I just want this little chunk of code to run and access these APIs, whether they're local process, remote process, remote network. Um, not really our lane, but we want to open up some of those lanes for other people to be able to innovate without us having to completely redefine everything we're doing for them to succeed. So yeah, I was just uh, I've been thinking about that a lot recently as we go through some of these. Um, like, why is the kubelet the right mechanism for like how how the kubelet handles pods is insane and complex that solves the problem that people have in process when we think about like new types of chunks of code running can we get them closer to where we need them to be uh, more effectively mm -hmm. nice um, all right more reading to do um thank you very much uh we'll see you all next week and we'll see you on the slack and internet wherever you can find us all right see you. bye thank you bye